So, um, as um, uh, Dr. Marcelo said, I work at the laboratory for diagnostic of zoonosis uh, at the Institute of Microbiology, which is like a department of the Faculty of Medicine, University of Ljubljana. Uh, so, um, our institute is the main institution for the clinical diagnostics. So, we work on the routine diagnostic on microbiological samples for a uh, university clinical center as well as for other clinics uh, in the country like being a tertiary center. And uh, besides, we are also national reference center which are sometimes also non-official uh, for influenza, hemorrhagic fevers, uh, uh, hepatitis viruses, HIV, HPV, tick transmitted pathogens which are much more my area. Uh, beside that, uh, uh, this is a part of uh, our laboratory or my laboratory, which also acts uh, since last year as an infrastructural center for research of uh, BSL free pathogens. And uh, we work on resistant mechanism, uh, we work on interactions with host immune system. Uh, we work uh, since ever on epidemiological studies, and we also look at the factors that uh, are affecting uh, emergency of the pathogens. Uh, we have quite uh, experienced and trained personnel. They have been trained to work in BSL-3 uh, at the UTMB in Galveston, Texas, and also last year at the Bernhard North Institute for a work as a BSL-4 agents. Um, my laboratory is also a partner in um, various global alert and response uh, of um, emerging pathogens. Uh, we have been um, WHO Collaborative Center for Ibroviruses and Hemorrhagic Fever Reference and Research since 2004 and since, uh, pardon, since 1994. Uh, since 2001, uh, we also became a partner in Global Alert uh, Response Network, uh, which work under the WHO for the outbreak of different uh, pathogenic microorganisms as we have led the mission of Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever in Kosovo at that time. Uh, we are also partners in uh, European mobile lab uh, that has a mission in West Africa Ebola outbreak and uh, as well we are partners uh, since the beginning of the action of uh, European network of imported viral diseases. Uh, we work on different research fields besides diagnostic and besides being a lecturer and, you know, I have to teach students also. Uh, but the most what I like, um, I like to work um, on, you know, different fields in research. When I have time, sometimes I just think this is my more or less hobby. Um, but um, the field uh, where we work um, are mainly viral zoonotic uh, diseases uh, caused by uh, different viruses. So um, the first one um, is tick-borne encephalitis caused by TB virus, then hantaviruses causing hemorrhagic fever with renal syndrome, uh, Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever. Then we have entered through the EM lab um, when it was that outbreak into Ebola field a little bit and uh, just lately a little bit into Zika field. Um, just a little bit as I am a lecturer, a professor, I have to start with some um, slides introducing what emerging infectious diseases are, but I'm sure you know exactly these are just definitions from the WHO. Um, usually can be new pathogens um, that cause um, old or new entities um, and can be already known pathogenic agents uh, that can appear in areas or species in which they have not been previously reported. So this we call like emerging uh, infectious diseases. Uh, Re-emerging infectious diseases are <clears throat> 
uh, those uh, pathogenic agents causing these uh, re-emerging infectious diseases that appear sometimes after many years of absence in areas where they have been already reported before. So these uh, are usually well known for rabies, brucellosis, anthrax is one of this case, um, tularemia also, and particularly we know that is for Ebola and Marburg viruses. Um, this is um, quite a um, um, busy slide, but uh, from this slide we can see uh, emerging infectious diseases uh, of the last maybe 20, 30 years, uh, beside uh, drug-resistant malaria or multidrug-resistant TBE or other bacterial infections, most of the emerging infections that we can see around the globe are viral infections. And those are really emerging or re-emerging. And most of them are uh, also so-called zoonoses. And what are zoonoses? Zoonoses are those diseases and infections um, that are naturally transmitted between the vertebrate animals and men. So uh, zoonotic pathogens cause infection in animals and are also transmissible to humans. So we can have, in one way, a natural reservoir, so a vertebrate that is natural reservoir of the zoonotic pathogen, or an animal that is uh, acceptable for that infection. Uh, so either way, or the reservoir host or infected uh, animal can be source of infection for men. Now I will continue uh, to tell you about five viruses uh, that uh, we have been working with, uh, or I have been working with for the last 35 years. Um, but uh, I will just uh, focus on only few results of each of the virus that we have been uh, actually presented in this uh, time. So the, the first one I started was really uh, more than 30 years ago. Uh, are hantaviruses that belong to the Bunyaviridae family. And this is the only genus uh, called hantavirus within the Bunyaviridae family uh, that is not arthropod born. Uh, but uh, the virus is transmitted by, uh, by the rodents, which serve as a natural reservoir. So the virus also has been lately very often found in insectivores and also in bats, but we don't know exactly if those isolates from insectivore and bats are also pathogenic for humans. So there are about 30 and more hantavirus species um, that are uh, more or less pathogenic to humans. And what they cause? They cause viral hemorrhagic fever one entity is hemorrhagic fever with renal syndrome. Uh, so the name already said what uh, affecting of the virus is. And the other one is hantavirus uh, cardiopulmonary syndrome, which is much more found in the New World, like uh, North and South America. While HFRS as a hemorrhagic fever with renal syndrome uh, is mainly uh, present in Euro-Asia. So how hantaviruses uh, are uh, transmitted? Uh, as I said, uh, small mammals are chronically infected. Uh, it is the same like with the rena viruses, if you might know this uh, uh, virus group. So there is a horizontal transmission of infection um, by indirect of aerosol transmission. Uh, or uh, sometimes in, in these small rodents also with uh, intraspecific aggressive behavior. So these uh, rodents serve as a natural reservoir, so they don't get sick, but they excrete uh, the virus uh, via their excreta, saliva, uh, feces, and urine. So when uh, these excreta 
are mixed uh, uh, with high or uh, with the aerosol, uh, man who is just incidental host actually uh, can be infected via inhalation uh, of the virus present in, in this excreta. So um, our first um, <clears throat> good point in uh, searching for hytoviruses were in early 88 um, we, we were able uh, to isolate the virus uh, which we name under the, the small village uh, in Dobrava, in Dolenska, in Slovenia uh, where this beautiful uh, yellow-necked field mice was captured. So I was able to cultivate the virus, which uh, was uh, suddenly recognized to be uh, very different from, at that time, known Hantan and Pumala hantaviruses. So I needed a long time to convince the research audience around the world that I have something new. And at the time, you can imagine, um, we didn't have that many uh, molecular tools that almost everyone or almost every, every laboratory now it has. So I have been working hard and uh, they didn't trust me that I have a new virus that is really different. Until um, they finally um, find something similar than the Brava virus and then they invited me to come to US and to work on that virus and to perform complete ca characterization at the USAMRIT. Uh, laboratories in Fort Dietrich. And uh, beside that, I found that this is not just a virus, but that this virus causes really, really severe forms, fatal forms of hemorrhagic fever with renal syndrome. Uh, like I said before, until that virus, there were <clears throat> only Pumala virus, um, no one uh, that is transmitted by bank wall uh, and has been uh, initially isolated in Finland and the prototype Hantan that has been found in, in uh, South Korea uh, by uh, Professor Ho Wang Lee in 1976. Uh, so um, why we were working with hantaviruses? Not because they were interesting, but because we have cases. In Slovenia, like uh, <coughs> Dr. Marcelo said, uh, that we are mainly working with the viruses that are endemic in our countries. Uh, since uh, 85, when I started to uh, work uh, with hantaviruses and introduce this diagnostic in uh, my laboratory, uh, we have been uh, calculating cases. Uh, the blue ones are um, you know, cases of Pumala, and um, uh, these uh, what, purple ones are cases of the Brava. Uh, and up to now, we have uh, probably around 520 cases uh, of uh, hantavirus infection, which have been all hospitalized. And we have approximately 8.5% fatality rate among those cases. And all the cases that, uh, uh, all fatal cases from, from Dubrava infection. And what is interesting, in, if, if we split this uh, 30 years curve in half, we see that uh, somewhere between 1990 and 2000, we had uh, the same number of cases of Dobrava and Pumala infection in my country. And then suddenly we have more and more Pumala cases, including uh, year 2012, which was the, the highest epidemic year in whole around the Europe, not only in our country. So, but now go back to much more molecular uh, part of, of uh, hantaviruses. So since the beginning in 85, we have already started to work on capturing small mammals around uh, the country. And um, we have been uh, trying to cultivate the virus uh, like we did Dobrava. Uh, but uh, it's, it is very, very difficult to, <clears throat> to, cultivate, the bra uh, to cultivate hantaviruses. So, uh, but what we have, we have uh, a lot of sequences uh, from uh, small mammals. Uh, pardon. Uh, we have uh, sequences from Pumala, Dobrava, and then we found also a subgroup of the Brava, which is now named Curcino virus. We also find Tula and Swiss virus, the two that are not uh, actually 
uh, still known to be pathogenic for humans. The Swiss virus is from shrews and from moles. So um, they're distributed all around the country, as you can see. But what we have done be uh, later on, this is a free segmented RNA genome of hantaviruses. We have been sequencing uh, like um, uh, almost complete L segment sequence from humans as well as from small mammals, about almost 200 sequences that we have received. And we have seen um, that um, <clears throat> the, the, the most divergent is Pumala virus in, in Slovenia, as you will see later on. And uh, Dobrava virus also have uh, free subgroups. Uh, also, we sequence the, the almost complete S segment, uh, but uh, only in already half of the samples we succeeded this. And the most hard is the M segment uh, that we re retrieve only uh, in approximately one third of the same samples uh, that we try to do. Uh, but what we have done later on, um, this is uh, what uh, my postdoc Natasha like to play <coughs> with. I used to say like to play, but it seems that it's not that easy. I, I don't know how she's doing that. Uh, but she is using GIS uh, information from each patient as well as GIS information from each rodent captured. And what we have seen is that there is a beautiful correlation uh, between the phylogenetic and geographical clustering. Uh, this is for Pomala L segment. So we have like free uh, like uh, subgroups of Pumala virus and they are very nicely distributed like south and uh, central part, the northeastern part and northern part. And the one that are empty uh, are, uh, are um, uh, sequences from humans, the ones with the dots are sequences uh, from the rodents. So they really nicely correlate. We have, you know, a little bit uh, of, of uh, uh, pilots here, but that's usually because people uh, have address uh, like GIS we took as a as a home address, but they have you know some weekends here. Uh, here is a nice uh, Pohoria area where they used to go for holidays. And the same we see for Dobrava. For Dobrava, we have also three subgroups of Dobrava. Again, they are very nicely separated, and we have this uh, particularly another. A uh, strain of the Brava called Curquino now that uh, has another rodent reservoir, which is Apodemus agrarius, not Apodemus flaviculis. And we also were able even to sequence uh, the virus directly from uh, a patient uh, which uh, has not been uh, known before for any of this kind of virus. But what uh, Natasha is even more playing, she is uh, trying to draw predictive maps. Uh, of hantavirus infection. Uh, this is based on the data that she was collecting, again, this GIS system uh, information for the last 20 years of the patients, including all the environmental uh, data like, uh, um, like precipitation, like temperature average, down, uh, snow coverage, and so on and so forth. And uh, she could predict how Pumala will be in future uh, present in Slovenia, more or less the same as it was before, very highly concentrated in this northeastern part. But Dobrava, the one that is a killer virus, will be much more present in the central south part, but it also goes here down to your place. So you should be worried. <laughs> uh, so clinically, those patients are very different. Uh, as I said, Dobrava is a real killer one. Uh, Pumala is much more milder virus. We have done a lot also of clinical uh, research on those. I, I will not go uh, into that detail, but uh, we showed that the Brava virus load uh, is associated with, uh, with the severity of the disease. So higher is the viral load, uh, much more severe disease uh, course will be in this patient. Um, Misha has done also, this is my postdoc <coughs> now, um, for her PhD also a little bit of HLA uh, and tried to find if there is any association with uh, uh, HFRS uh, 
patients in, infected with Puma and Dobrava. She found only HLA B35 and DRB13 for Pumala. Uh, and definitely, what she could conclude that were statistically significantly different um, that um, different hantaviruses are presented differently through the same HLL molecule. And we have stopped working on that issue here, and I'm pushing her to continue. Uh, but now she is busy with other stuff. Um, we have been measuring cytokines uh, in different uh, patients, like in CCHF. We have found that uh, IL-10, IL-12 are very important for the prediction of, of the fatality. Uh, but what we have seen in, in hantavirus, it's, it's not that... Um, um, not that clear like in other viral hemorrhagic fever, but still uh, we think that the imbalance in production of uh, pro-inflammatory and the regulatory cytokines uh, might be associated with the severity of the disease. And uh, now <coughs> we will go to the emerging um, vector-borne, the real vector-borne diseases that are transmitted by vectors. Uh, you see that, uh, that uh, one of them are is also tick-borne encephalitis uh, that uh, is also emerging. I'm sure you know everything or even much more than me about tick-borne encephalitis because I have been heard that you are working here with this virus, so I don't need to do any introduction. And that we have like uh, three subtypes, European, Siberian, and Far Eastern that are somehow um, connected with the uh, main vector of the tick and distribution of the tick and some uh, mixture part uh, also particularly in the Baltic countries. Uh, this phylogenetic tree has been constructed by uh, my uh, PhD student at the time. Now he has left uh, our laboratory uh, while well, he uh, finally completed the whole uh, um, the whole genome sequence of the strain Ljubljana. Uh, this strain Ljubljana has actually been isolated from my own brain because I have been infected with tick-borne encephalitis in 1992, uh, while um, I have not been uh, vaccinated to protect myself at the time. But I had uh, one summer just idea I had to cultivate the virus. And since I didn't have uh, cell cultures at the time, I just was working with um, uh, suckling uh, mice brain. And uh, while uh, performing this cultivation, actually it seems that also excreta of the mice um, have been infectious. I've infected myself. And um, so um, I had a very severe uh, meningoencephalitis, have been hospitalized. Uh, two times for 14 days. But you see, I survived. The virus cleared my, <laughs> my brain. My students used to say, uh, it, it, it seems that the virus really cleaned your brain because you, you remember every small thing in the lab. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> uh, anyway, but then I, um, I took my acute blood and I went again uh, to a mouse brain. Um, and uh, then from the mouse brain to the cell culture. And this is the virus uh, that is now called Ljubljana. So you know also exactly how the virus is transmitted in the nature. So human beings are really not important for the virus to sustain in the nature. But the most important are, are ticks uh, that are transmitting the virus uh, with different ways, sexual, which is not very efficient, but transovarial. Uh, also not that much efficient because dilution of the virus with the, uh, with the um, uh, stages. Uh, but uh, uh, transstadial, uh, it's important, particularly with the co-feeding transmission uh, when larvae and nymphs are co-feeding at the same time uh, on, on a reservoir, uh, which doesn't need to be viremic even to be uh, infected. So tick-borne encephalitis is very highly endemic in our country. Um, as we have uh, like uh, two to 300 cases per year on average, but we have just 
uh, discussed that last year was a very, very minimal year. We had less than 100 cases. And uh, <clears throat> this, you see, it's a very different uh, number of cases uh, per year that we have. And as much darker is the municipality, that means a higher incidence of infection is in the country. So again, playing of Natasha, who like to play all with these graphs and, and uh, maps and so on. So, but this is part of uh, actually her PhD thesis. What we have done, we have been collecting ticks for four consecutive years in eight locations every month. So we have been choose locations based on the um, based on the um, uh, number or or incidence of tick-borne encephalitis. So we took also uh, you know the region here, Cherlikal, which is just close to you, your place because there there we have no cases at all. The same in northeastern part, and then the central Slovenia where uh, the the virus seems to be very active. Uh, <clears throat> what we have seen, we have seen uh, definitely that we have on average 0.35% of infection of this. That means less than 1%, which is consistent what they have found in other countries uh, in Central Europe. But there is still a little bit difference between the regions like here in Sodrzica, uh, which is the highest percentage of infection. What we have seen also that we have B model seasonal dynamic uh, of, of the ticks uh, as well as adult ticks as well as uh, larvae and nymph in the central part of the country, except in the coastal region like here, that, that uh, Chernikal, uh, that we have only unimodal activity. So this is influenced by the temperature and humidity, and she was calculating the saturation deficit. So um, what are important? Again, important are rodents, because the larvae and nymph, they fed on rodents, mainly on small mammals. So we have been using the same rodents as we have been captured for hantaviruses, also, we checked them for tick-borne encephalitis, and we found a lot, or everywhere we, where we have checked rodents to be seropositive, and we have found a nice correlation between the prevalence of infection in rodents with the tick-borne influenza, with the tick-borne uh, encephalitis incidence in humans. But when Natasha checked rodents with uh, with PCR. She have uh, uh, found very interesting that the uh, viremia in rodents is much more long-lasting than it was believed before. And uh, we think particularly that Myodes glareolus, uh, which is the bank wall, seems to be the most important uh, natural reservoir. And the most important thing is that we have some, uh, some special samples of, of uh, uh, particular rodents that their all internal organ, including blood, were completely negative for tick-borne encephalitis, but the brain. So, uh, and particularly the brain were very highly positive in, in the uh, myodes glareolus. But then Luca came to our laboratory and he started to sequence uh, he started to sequence uh, directly from uh, human material sequences uh, from rodents and from ticks. And what, we, what he has seen, uh, the E protein and NS5 protein, he has seen that we have a very uh, divergent uh, virus in Slovenia, uh, uh, but it was nicely seen uh, that uh, the sequences from the same geographical region, or from the human, or from the rodent, or from the ticks, cluster together. So that means uh, that the virus really is present in this microfossize, as it was known for, from before, and that usually people are mainly infected in the house where they are living, or just area uh, very close to their living. Uh, so then again, he wrote uh, this um, like five, six groups, uh, genetical, uh, that are uh, clustering like much more on the north 
and the southern part of Slovenia, which in a way is nice because we have a, a huge river named Sava that uh, uh, border uh, Slovenia in two parts. Uh, and as well, we have this, uh, um, how do you say, highway, Autostrada, <laughs> which is very important for the small mammals and also for uh, uh, big mammals. Uh, as, a, as a natural barrier. Um, yeah. So, uh, hosts for the ticks are also livestock, uh, like, uh, <clears throat> like cows or, or um, goats and, and sheep. Uh, but they usually don't get sick and they don't get enough varemia to be a reservoir host for the ticks. But what they did, they get infection and while they get infection, they can excrete the virus in their excreta, including milk. So then if we um, drink a raw milk or if we eat uh, products made of raw milk, uh, not pasteurized, not thermically uh, affected, we can be infected. And we have shown and we have published this in IID in uh, 90, 2013. We had an, a nice outbreak of four people who were drunk um, uh, goat milk, actually from colostrum, which is immediately after the goat had the baby, which is where it was very, very highly infected with the virus. We have uh, uh, detected also the virus also in goats. Uh, so it was fine, uh, like three people got sick um, and uh, only one didn't get sick because he was vaccinated already uh, with free booster doses. So next virus which I would like to tell you is the Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever virus uh, that we have started to be involved in uh, with um, in 2001, while the WHO Goran uh, asked us to assist in the outbreak in Kosovo, uh, because the Kosovo people uh, wanted us to be there while they have this outbreak, as we have been working with them already uh, previous 10 years on hantaviruses and also CCHF. So also is um, a virus that uh, belongs to the Bunia virida, but the genus Nairovirus. Uh, so, uh, the virus is transmitted by the ticks, uh, but not the tick Ixodes ricinus, as is uh, uh, tick-borne encephalitis, but the tick is called Hyaloma, Hyaloma marginatum, which is uh, um, a huge uh, tick and is uh, very rarely found uh, here in the continental part of the Europe. Uh, so the virus is transmitted within the ticks, transovarial, transstadial transmission, and small mammals, probably even including terrestrial birds, uh, and can be uh, transmitted, uh, the virus can be transmitted with a tick bite to the goats and sheep, also probably cows, directly to humans, but the humans can also be infected while, um, while butchering uh, while butchering goats and sheep that are infected and that are very dynamic. Uh, and also the virus can be transmitted uh, like a secondary infection uh, from the patients because this, uh, uh, those patients usually uh, have heavy bleeding from uh, nose, uh, have melena, hematemesis, and so on. So uh, if you try to stop bleeding uh, those patients, you can uh, get infection from mycotrauma uh, in, in your fingers or uh, your mucus. So this is um, uh, one of the uh, viruses that is very uh, heavily um, uh, distributed in, in Africa, uh, Middle East, Asia. Uh, and uh, lately it uh, caused a, a huge epidemic, particularly in uh, Turkey. Uh, while we have been working with the people in Kosovo, we have been able to isolate uh, the virus uh, that we named Kosovo Hoti. Hoti is just uh, the last name of the patient from 
uh, which we isolate to the virus. Uh, we have uh, completely sequenced it and uh, uh, found that it uh, clustered into the Europe 1 lineage. Otherwise, uh, CCHF has like six uh, genetic lineages. Uh, but then again, Luca, who liked to play it uh, while he was working in my lab with uh, sequencing uh, uh, human samples, uh, he has found as we had uh, human samples collected from 2000, actually from 1994 up to 2001, up to 2012, uh, he has found that uh, there are approximately five different uh, genetic variations of the virus present. This is, uh, this is the country of Kosovo, all around the very high incidence. That, that's the complete S segment, that's partial S segment, and that's partial M segment. And that the virus has not been changed uh, within the last 12, 20 years that much uh, as we have been expected. Uh, we have been working also on um, on seroepidemiology uh, in uh, people in uh, Kosovo, in uh, healthy inhabitants. Also, we have been working with uh, animals and we have been sequencing uh, some uh, ticks from Kosovo that have been uh, entered together with the sequences with uh, uh, human beings. How we enter into Ebola uh, outbreak or actually a huge epidemic, not only outbreak, uh, was, uh, I don't need to, uh, to tell you about how it started because I'm sure you know that very much. Um, we uh, have been uh, involved into um, Ebola because uh, we are a partner of the European Mobile Laboratory. Uh, this is the consortium that has been uh, organized uh, just a year and started to be funded just a year be before the Ebola outbreak. And the mission of it is to, um, to um, have a risk group for agents in combination with the capacity building in sub-Saharan Africa. And um, this... Um, laboratory should be just uh, transported immediately if needed in sub-Saharan Africa uh, when something happened. So it was really started to be organized and founded a year before the outbreak. Uh, it is led by uh, Stefan Ginter in uh, Bernhard Institute and also supported by the German army. Uh, so they included us um, uh, to be uh, also part of this consortium uh, and uh, my postdoc now, uh, Misha, uh, has been trained a few times in, in um, uh, Germany and also in UK uh, before the outbreak started how to work in this mobile laboratory. So this is the case how um, the WHO uh, called uh, Mobile Laboratory, um, that means Stefan Günther, uh, two days uh, uh, after uh, they and also Pasteur Institute have confirmed that the uh, outbreak seems to be in early March 2014 Ebola. So they immediately packed the Mobile Laboratory. Uh, this is in the Munich lab, uh, this is the Munich airport. This is how they <coughs> then transported from the Conakry in Guinea uh, for two days to come to Gekedu. Uh, this is the, the nice route, but this is usually how the routes look like. Uh, if you go by car, you need like two days. Uh, some people had chance they could fly from Conakry to Gekedu. Uh, so they started to build the hospital. Uh, the treatment center as well as the laboratory. So the laboratory look like this. So this is the first uh, group uh, who came and started to work. Uh, this was the first uh, laboratory uh, who actually uh, worked uh, the out, uh, epidemic of Ebola. So this is how <coughs> they started to work uh, in the laboratory. Uh, this is like a... Um, biosafety hood. Um, so the boxes, uh, the shipping boxes are also uh, then something uh, where you can put something, where you can see it and so on. Uh, so you have to be very 
uh, flexible, uh, but everything was working great. And the uh, European Mobile Lab had five uh, places during the epidemic, not only this one laboratory, five places, and it's still present in Guinea and it's still present in Sierra Leone since the first day uh, because WHO uh, asked us to be there present for a while. Uh, but then we have modernized ourselves. We also went to uh, Conakry uh, and uh, the English part of the mobile lab has brought this uh, mini ion, which I'm sure you know it, and they started to uh, perform deep sequencing uh, on site. And the <clears throat> result of this was um, that uh, um, we wanted, I would say we wanted, I was not the, the one who coordinated this research, but the, uh, the coordinator of the, of the EMA lab, uh, Stefan Ginter, uh, we didn't know actually how the whole epidemic was going on during this uh, almost two-year period. So we had samples uh, like from March 2014 from the very early beginning, including uh, the, the, the first case uh, up to January 2015. And what we have seen, because the epidemiological data, particularly not at the time or last year, were not completely clean and are not clean since now, definitely not. But from sequences of uh, approximately 180 patients with a complete genome uh, with uh, <clears throat> Deep sequencing, uh, we have found that actually the virus, um, uh, the virus uh, are represented in two lineages, A and B, and that the virus somewhere in April, May, actually entered from Guinea to, uh, to Sierra Leone, and then from Sierra Leone to Liberia, and at the end also for very few cases in Mali. Uh, what uh, we have seen also is that um, uh, as the epidemic expanded, actually, when we thought it will be the end uh, in 2014, sometime May, June, actually expanded. When it happened that the virus definitely came from Guinea to, to Sierra Leone, uh, and um, this, um, this lineage A actually stayed here, but then uh, it turns out to be this lineage B. We went through the whole uh, time period in uh, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and even turned back to Guinea then later on and uh, performed much higher uh, index case that it was uh, the first row. Uh, so by looking different uh, genes of the virus, um, there were not that much... Uh, uh, mutations uh, important, so there was a much lower late, uh, rate of mutation that uh, people were feared, at least from our data. Uh, maybe not that much GP and MP, but the VP24, VP30, and VP40 uh, genes uh, definitely that are important ones. Uh, so now I will finish with the Zika virus that you, I'm sure you also know very well. Um, that I don't need to introduce anything about the virus, uh, that it belongs um, to the vector, um, uh, vector mosquito uh, part of the flaviviruses uh, in the phylogenetic tree, and that the virus is uh, circulating in nature in a sylvatic cycles, uh, but then it comes or with the humans or with the a mosquito vector to the urban cycle, uh, which causes outbreaks or epidemics as we are facing now in Southern and uh, uh, America. So um, it was thought that principal uh, vector of the virus is it is Egypti, uh, but we are, we are not sure anymore that this is the only and the principal vector. Uh, so people are working very hard on that issue. Uh, and um, we are afraid that there are ma uh, many other uh, genuses uh, or sorts of uh, mosquitoes that can uh, easily and sufficiently uh, transmit the virus. Uh, so Zika was not really interesting um, as causing disease. Uh, 
because uh, it is believed that uh, only 20% of people show clinical symptoms, uh, which even for a healthy person doesn't mean anything like uh, uh, viral infection with fever, probably conjunctivitis, uh, joint pain, and uh, most of the time macular papilla rash, unless uh, <coughs> It has been um, well documented already in, in the French Polynesia outbreak uh, of the quite often uh, post-infectious Guillain-Barré Guillain syndrome uh, as a complication of the uh, Zika virus infection and the microcephaly that uh, appears to be very, very evident in the uh, starting of Brazil epidemic. Uh, I'm pretty sure you also know the, the history uh, of the virus, which uh, is um, coming out from Africa as all the important and interesting viruses are uh, through Southeast Asia to Micronesia to Polynesia uh, and looking around that way and through the islands to the South uh, American continent and is now spreading up to uh, other islands uh, in the Caribbean uh, part. Uh, the virus is transmitted, uh, pardon, the virus is transmitted um, uh, in the nature, as I said, between probably uh, primates and mosquitoes. And then when it comes to the urban cycle, uh, human beings normally are reservoirs of the virus and uh, then is the very nice transmission between the virus and the human. So if there is a sustained population of a high level population of uh, susceptible um, um, mosquitoes, at the same time a very dense population of naive and susceptible people, we will have what we are have now in uh, particularly in northeast part of Brazil and other surrounding countries. Uh, so the virus has been found in saliva, in blood, in serum, very worrying in semen, very high level uh, in semen, in urine. So urine and blood are also uh, the diagnostic uh, uh, samples for PCR. Uh, but unfortunately, the virus seems to also infect, uh, can pass uh, through the placenta and can infect then a fetus. Uh, when it was uh, first um, uh, notice was like uh, last year, late October, mid October were first promet notice, and then um, late October um, that in northeast part of Brazil, particularly Rio Grande do Norte and Paraiba, um, that they have seen um, quite a higher number of microcephalic uh, uh, children born. Uh, particularly where was at the same time very high incidence of Zika virus infection. Although Zika virus came to Brazil uh, already in, in spring that year. Uh, but you would then calculate that uh, those babies, that mothers should be probably infected in April, May, June last year, were delivered like uh, uh, later that same year. Uh, and the WHO, as particularly CDC, were very standby at the beginning, so that means like uh, uh, November, December, although then WHO started really to act very fastly. And uh, you might remember that uh, Margaret Chen, uh, Director uh, General of WHO, has also declared this as a public health emergency uh, global uh, global emergency in uh, February 1st this year. Uh, so um, we have uh, had the possibility uh, to have the um, um, actually sad story of a woman, a pregnant woman, um, who was uh, in Brazil um, and uh, actually um, ended with um, uh, in, in our hospital and uh, we had the possibility actually to uh, look for the Zika virus in this fetus. Um, so um, 
a very young, uh, actually, student of biology uh, came to our department of perinatology in Ljubljana um, because uh, she was diagnosed in her hometown um, that um, uh, her fetus uh, has anomalies. Um, uh, based on, on um, uh, her story, she lived in and worked in as a volunteer in Natal Rio do Grande do Norte in Brazil, the, the place where there were the highest incidence of Zika, uh, since December 2013. Um, so, in um, actually, she got pregnant like uh, the end of February last year, and while she was at the end of her first trimester, she had um, clinical symptoms that were compatible with Zika virus, and um, actually, it was just started to be the uh, epidemic at the time in in this place. So nobody really have diagnosed that. But uh, as she was worried, and uh, because she also needed to, to see a doctor, um, she went to a um, perinatologist in, in uh, Natal. Um, and she uh, told um, the doctor what signs she had, like for a week. And the doctor said, um, well, don't worry. Uh, this is just a uh, well, virus, and everything will be OK. Uh, which was a normal reaction of perinatologists at the time because nobody knew that anything is implicated with Zika and the babies. So uh, she had ultrasound visit, uh, that means 14 and 40 weeks of gestation, which showed complete normal fetal growth and uh, anatomy. So um, she then... Um, while she was like uh, seven months pregnant, uh, decided to turn back to Europe because she said, I wanted to deliver my baby in my hometown. And uh, <clears throat> then she uh, was already like uh, around 30 weeks of gestation and she visited um, again a perinatologist uh, where um, there have been seen already intrauterine growth retardation. Uh, uh, Although amniotic fluid was normal, uh, then also had circumference uh, below the second percentile which, uh, of, the sh of gestation, which uh, usually uh, has been already uh, claimed for microcephaly. And uh, <clears throat> also the brain structure were blurred, and there were numerous classifications that could have been seen here and here. Uh, in the, the various parts of the brain. Uh, so she, um, uh, she then came to our uh, tertiary center in Ljubljana and um, they perform again ultrasound and magnetic resonance and um, they told her that uh, the, there is a very poor prognosis for the neonatal health of her baby. And um, then she uh, made a decision and she requested a medical termination of a pregnancy. It was uh, quite a, a late pregnancy. Um, but this need to be approved by the National and Hospital Ethical Committee. So it took another week uh, that uh, they received this uh, permission. Uh, and um, then at the delivery, <clears throat> when the baby was... Uh, actually like stillborn delivered, not stillborn, but it was terminated. Uh, there was no morphological anomaly seen macroscopically. Uh, and uh, in, in uh, such kind of cases, um, uh, an autopsy is uh, normally performed and is uh, permanent uh, because they have to find out uh, uh, what is the reason of uh, such anomalies? Uh, because they need to give uh, an advances uh, uh, for the mother or for her next uh, possible pregnancy if there are some genetic or whatever reasons. Uh, so a top three result microscopically showed uh, this is a Zika brain. Uh, a, we call it you know, Zika brain, but the brain from uh, this baby boy. Uh, and uh, the same gestational age uh, brain from a girl um, 
uh, who has died, um, who has been terminated uh, pregnancy because of some other reasons. And we can uh, normally see the, the, uh, the, the gyros here, no gyration here. Um, the microencephaly, which is uh, for standard deviation before uh, below average, uh, they have only 84 grams. Normally, they have approximately of 300 grams at that gestational age. Uh, the section of autopsy uh, also show complete agiria, particularly front in the front uh, lobe compared to the, the one of the normal uh, brain at the same uh, time. And uh, calcifications you can see here and here also in the uh, other type. Hydrocephalus due to the damaged brain cortex has been also seen uh, uh, also in the white matter. Uh, then pathologists uh, perform some um, uh, microscopic analysis. Um, again, um, classification, no gyration has been seen uh, in, in uh, the samples. Um, then uh, immunohistochemistry uh, have shown the proliferative activated astrocytes and microglia cells uh, and macrophages in the cortex of the brain tissue. Uh, in the spinal cord, there was hypoplasia uh, of, of the brain stem and uh, of the lateral corticospinal tract. Uh, so they also performed uh, immunofluorescence staining uh, of the brain tissue uh, at the pathology department uh, of our faculty uh, by using, uh, at the time we didn't have monoclonal antibodies um, for, um, against Zika. Actually, we don't have it either now. We have a pan flavor monoclonal antibodies against E protein. Uh, but I just said, okay, we have mother serum. We can use it uh, and see what we will see. Uh, we see that uh, actually there was a nice fluorescence in neurons uh, because uh, they have uh, autofluorescence uh, with lipofuscine granules uh, seen in orange here. And some of the negative controls have been used. Um, so there was no relevant pathological changes in other fetal organ but the brain tissue. Uh, so, also no in the umbilical cord, not uh, in placenta, um, no changes in membranes of the fetus, um, and uh, we have performed, actually not we, but the uh, uh, medical geneticians, uh, the obstetricity department have performed microarray, um, and the fetal karyotype show normal profile uh, 46XY. Uh, uh, um, so then we started at our institute in microbiology and look at the insection of fetal brain by transmission electron microscopy. Although I have to notice you that the brain tissue was very damaged because the tissue was very autolyzed. So we had a very hard time to get the ni nice um, uh, samples. Uh, but um, <clears throat> we have seen... Um, these are vacuoles, but not the, the viruses, but this vacuole with the virus, which is here uh, in a higher man magnitude, uh, were showing the, the cluster of virus that probably are in disrupted endoplasmatic reticulum. Uh, and again, uh, when we have uh, had uh, some of the uh, fresh uh, frozen uh, brain tissue left, uh, we perform some negative staining uh, of uh, uh, the virus, uh, which we have seen like um, envelope structures within a brighter interior here. And then uh, this is a negative staining after ultracentrifugation, which will give you only the virus particle if it's in. So uh, we were definitely sure that this is the virus. Uh, that uh, we have been looking for. So we had uh, looked actually from uh, for nine different tissue of the fetus directly by using PCR. Actually, that was the shockest day for me for the last half uh, a year. Uh, when we received um, the uh, material, um, actually, the, um, 
pathologist, uh, resident pathologist, uh, gave me a call on Friday afternoon. Uh, you know, all the important cases happened day before Christmas or Friday afternoon, and even I'm talking Friday afternoon here. Uh, it's uh, uh, gave me a call, and I said, "Look." I, uh, I'm responsible now to make a topsy of a fetus, and um, do you know anything about Zika? And I said, what are you asking me? That was like middle October last year. And he said, you know, I was listening to your lectures while I was uh, studying um, medicine. That, that's not that far, that long ago. And I remember you were telling us about these uh, exotic tropical viruses. I remember chikungunya, but I don't remember, and dengue, but I don't remember that you mentioned Zika. So I am calling you. Can you perform any text on Zika? And I said, sure, I can. And we have this diagnostic already in our laboratory since nine, uh, 2013 because of this um, uh, French Polynesia outbreak. We immediately uh, introduced the diagnostic in our laboratory. <clears throat> uh, and I said, why are you asking me this? And he said, because you know, this was a termination of pregnancy. He was all confused, uh, changing subjects. And he said, um, and the lady was uh, living in Brazil. And it, it, it could be that she was infected with, with Zika. And I said, well, don't worry. We will do everything. And uh, just take care that you will uh, um, give us all appropriate, appropriate material what we need. And I said, we need for <laughs> virology fresh material. Don't pour it into formalin, because you know pathologists they just pour everything in formalin. They wait for three, four weeks. They don't you know, care later on, and so on. So that was very, very tricky part of it. So it was very good. He called me, and I gave him advice, really, after two hours when he Finish a top C. He personally brought the material to uh, my laboratory. <clears throat> so we got all these uh, kind of uh, samples. And I, I uh, asked uh, uh, my people to, to work on that on Saturday morning because I couldn't wait until Monday. Uh, that's, I'm not a really good boss. <laughs> so. Uh, and I don't know, I just felt it, that it will be something. So I asked them to work on, um, to perform PCR on all three, uh, all three samples, or all nine samples to extract in two different methods RNA. Uh, so it was already like 18 samples and to uh, simultaneously detect uh, Zika. Dengue and chikungunya, because those were three viruses that can cause similar clinical picture and are present there where the lady was. Um, and then they called me, can you boss please come down from your office? We have results. And I came down and they said, please sit down. <laughs> tell me, I can't wait for what you will gonna tell me. And they said, um, we have positive result, and I said, okay, good. I was expecting that. What we have positive? We have Zika positive. I said, oh, Jesus, no way. Only Zika, yes, only Zika. What sample? Everything? No, only brain. Then I was really shocked. Because, you know, there were like two days before that, I had read the first information through the PROMET and PAHO page that there, this is increase of microcephaly in Brazil. And then I had brain of a fetus, only Zika positive. I was expecting at least placenta or any other material, nothing. And I said, okay, I don't trust you. Can you please repeat everything again? It was like, oh, again, you know, it was all bad boss again. So they repeated. And they got the same result. So we started with the NS5 gene. And since I was not convinced yet, I asked them, can you please perform PCR also on the other gene? And can you please sequence this, these two uh, amplicons? And again and again, it come from brain and Zika, E gene, NS5, and so on. And it was in very high copies. 
So then we decided just to go and to, uh, we have put the, the material into cell culture. We didn't succeed so far by using two different cell cultures to cultivate the virus from the brain. Uh, but we did the complete uh, gene, um, <clears throat> genome sequence uh, recovered from the brain tissue. And this was Misha doing during the Christmas and New Year time. And then she was already very hot. I have to do it. Although at the beginning they were like, oh, she wanted us to continue and to repeat and to confirm everything and so on. So anyway, we have also had to exclude that this uh, child didn't have any other infection or any other causative agents that are known to cause uh, probably microcephaly or that are much more known to be teratogenic. So we have been performing all these different uh, viruses and also toxoplasmosis. And uh, then we got uh, immediately after the, the Christmas time, the full length genome uh, by using iotorrent technology uh, and the sequence uh, where we plotted with, uh, with the other complete uh, genome sequences uh, known at the time at the gene bank. There are not any, many much more uh, complete genome sequences since now. Uh, but we have seen uh, again that the virus in Brazil actually uh, derived from French Polynesia. And uh, we know that this is now Asian lineage and this is uh, African lineage, as we call it already now. Um, but again, we didn't uh, have um, shown that the mother actually was infected with Zika because you know, she had these Simpson symptoms uh, the end of May last year. She had termination of pregnancy um, middle second half of, of October. That was the first time she visited us. So uh, she was uh, completely IgM negative to all the viruses, uh, including Zika. And she was positive, not to Zika only, and you know the problem with cross-reactivity in flaviviruses but also very high to dengue, to West Nile, to Japanese encephalitis, and so on and so forth, even including tick-borne encephalitis because of the cross-reactivity. So then we have to start to grow um, very fastly uh, the viruses to perform neutralization tests. And thank God we <clears throat> had left, um, this is another story, uh, this Uganda strain 976. Um, which actually was um, something that I, um, um, I don't know the English word, but anyway, uh, my, um, my mentor, my boss, Professor Likar, who died six years ago, I was working in early 60s at the Yale Institute with Jordi Casals. And Jordi Casals, Professor Jordi Casals from the Yale Institute, was a real pioneer of arbovirology in the world. So he worked with him in 1962-63. Uh, and uh, while he came home, he brought a bunch of different arboviruses that the group from Yale was uh, searching for decades in Africa and everywhere in Southeast Asia, including Zika. They were all leophilized. And I remember when he was retiring, he came to my laboratory, actually, we were all the time contacting, and he said, look, this is a box, and in this box there are a lot of ampules of old, I don't know, a bunch of viruses. I never checked them. I just got them from Jordi. Uh, I can throw them away, or probably you can keep them. Maybe you're the only one who will probably once need it. So from that box, I already have all the dengue viruses that we are using in our laboratory, including now Zika, which I opened, when I remember that I have to perform neutralization tests, and for neutralization tests you, you need a live virus like all other that I have in my laboratory. So um, I ask immediately people to go and um, to put that uh, leophilized Uganda virus on the cell culture and it grow like this, no problem. We sequence it and check everything was okay. So um, I said, okay, now we have 
almost everything, just write the paper. <laughs> so um, that was a conclusion uh, that was a really severely affected central nervous system of this fetus. Uh, we concluded that the virus has, <laughs> based on our results, neurotropic effect. Uh, probably it is in neurons, and this is now a race who will find the real cells of the virus. Um, and we think that, at least in our case, the, the development of, of the cortex um, uh, actually arrested in approximate uh, 20 weeks of gestation. Uh, and we also think because uh, <clears throat> Although the, the endoplasmatic reticulum was damaged in our uh, electron microscopy slides, but still uh, we think that the virus persists uh, in the brain uh, tissue for a while. Uh, and this is my laboratory. Thank you.